This episode of Doc Talk is brought to you by the Cap of Boot Scootin' Ball, featuring the president of the Redneck Yacht Club himself, Craig Morgan. Nice trackers, bayliners, and a party ball. Join us Friday, April 5th for the Knoxville's most talked about fundraiser of the year. The event will be packed with great country music provided by Craig Morgan, line dancing, western themed dinner, bottomless beverage, and an exclusive Cap of Boot Scootin' Ball souvenir mug. Additionally, a silent auction valued at more than $40,000. Give the opportunity for those in attendance to bid on some packages, including a Dynasty Spa. For tickets, visit kappabootscootin.com. Hi there. Welcome to Doc Talk. Doc Talk is a podcast that is put out by the Knoxville Academy of Medicine that talks about health issues in plain language. I'm Elise Denaney, former president of the Knoxville Academy of Medicine, and today I am so happy to meet with Dr. Matt Mancini, who is a friend, a colleague. He is the president of the Tennessee Medical Association and a aficionado and an expert when it comes to bariatric surgery. Today we're going to talk about bariatric surgery. He is associated with university surgeons at the University of Tennessee Medical Center, Knoxville. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Elise. Great to be here. (laughs) It is. It always is. (laughs) Uh, Okay. Bariatric surgery. What is bariatric surgery? Well, it's basically the surgery that deals with patients that are obese or morbidly obese. So bariatrics is the Greek bari, which is weight. So basically weight-related surgery. Okay. Is there a specific definition of obese? There are. Basically, it's a equation that takes a patient's height and their weight. And then there are basically a normogram of what's a normal weight or BMI, which is, means body mass index. And when you're a certain weight to height, then your BMI is a certain number. And then based on a BMI, there's a gradation from going from underweight to normal weight to overweight to obese, and then on to the more morbidly obese. Okay. So nobody wants to be overweight because being overweight has all of those problems and more wear and tear on your joints and everything. So other than bariatric surgery, is there certain things that we can do as an individual to prepare for bariatric surgery? Well, not everybody needs to have a weight loss procedure. And obviously, we all have the opportunity to choose the right healthy foods, to build exercise into our daily routine. But as people have become more and more uh, overscheduled and overtaxed, patients or people don't make the time to eat correctly, take the time to eat, and take the time to exercise. So as time has persisted, People that normally didn't struggle with their weight now have compounded their weight as well as their health problems that go along with being obese, and that is diabetes, which is the fastest growing health problem in the United States, Uh, high blood pressure, Um, as you mentioned, being hard on the skeleton, so early, you know, knee replacements and joint replacements that was unheard of 20 years ago to be done in a, you know, middle-aged person. So if I got my weight under better control, I could conceivably get off of my blood pressure medication, get off of my diabetic medication, save a ton of money, and oh, that would be great. So, um, Most people don't start when they're overweight, and that's kind of their opportunity, is when we see them being overweight or kind of class one obesity, which most people today's standards, they say, I'm, I'm fine, I'm just like everybody else. But they start to have, you know, their blood sugar is starting to rise and their blood pressure starting to rise and they're starting to notice that they're not able to be as active as they were at a lower weight. And so they kind of miss that opportunity. So most of the patients that I see that are being considered for a weight loss operation can't get back to their normal weight based on just exercise alone because their knees are already bad or their hips are already bad. So it, it's difficult if they can't exercise to get yeah. back towards their, their physiologic you know, weight. It gets to be a real vicious cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I'm a candidate for surgery. 
I'm thinking about having bariatric surgery. Does that mean you zip me open from side to side? <laughs> no, the good news is, is most of our weight loss operations now are done minimally invasive, so very small incisions. And most of them are done as just a one night stay in the hospital. Really? And so there are two main options that we offer. One is called the sleeve gastrectomy, which we're making the stomach much more narrow at the top. That's a one night stay in the hospital. And then the other option is called the gastric bypass, which is when we make a smaller stomach and then bypass part of their intestinal tract to help with them not absorbing the nutrients as efficiently. And that's a two night stay. But both operations within two to three weeks, most people are back to you know, fairly normal activities and are able to go back to work. Wow, how, how long generally are they sleeping? They do it under general, right? Absolutely, general so they're done as a general anesthetic yeah. and both operations are usually done within an hour to an hour and a half. Okay, and then recovery time? Usually about two, two to three weeks. Okay, and then what are, what's my diet like? That's, that's... No Big Macs. <clears throat> that's correct. I mean, <laughs> the opportunities that we have, because most insurance companies require them, the patient, to work with uh, a qualified center of excellence for six months before their surgery, is that we actually get the opportunity to kind of teach them healthy habits, work in some physical exercise, look at food choices, but they're going to be eating smaller portion sizes. So they have to, we have to actually re train them how to chew slower and to swallow not so fast and not to drink lots of liquids while they're eating. So there is some teaching that we do before surgery that helps them be more successful after surgery. Um, and they do have a clear liquid and protein supplements for about two weeks before and two weeks after, which sounds impossible, but no one has a trouble with it. I wouldn't imagine so because if you're making the stomach smaller, doesn't that mean it gets feeling fuller quicker? It does. It does. Yeah. But we don't want them taking carbonated sodas and we don't want them eating improper foods and putting stress on that new surgical stapling line. So we want them to be protective of that for a few weeks to let it heal. Okay. Then after a few weeks we can... Have then they can start eating normal foods, <laughs> just smaller, what do we say, the appetizer size, not the entree size. Appetizer size. Okay. Right. All right. So, you know, some of these people, they want to exercise also to complement mm -hmm. their diet change. So they probably wouldn't exercise a little bit after the surgery until they heal. Typically, we don't want anything strenuous for about three weeks after the surgery. But most people are able to get out and vigorously walk, you know, even a few days after surgery. I know everybody who are my friends who have had bariatric surgery have had, been so happy and so pleased. Um, did there, does insurance cover for it? Insurances do. Uh, most insurances have specific requirements, meaning your body mass index needs to be 35 or above with a health problem, meaning high blood pressure, diabetes, heart, uh, heart issues, osteoarthritis. But a lot of insurance companies carve it out as an exclusion. So we still see more than half of insurance companies that would cover it, but the individual policy, maybe the employer doesn't want that to be a covered benefit. Mm. So patients have insurance, but their employer has decided that it's not important to that uh, job to have those benefits. So patients are kind of in that donut hole where they don't have coverage, even though they have great insurance. So it's like an a la carte item that might have not been picked That's up. That's correct. So we should check our own individual policy. Yes. All right. So if I was going to have bariatric surgery <clears throat> and I'm trying to prepare my family for what to do, should I um, get meals prepared and put them in the freezer ahead of time? Typically, um, we you know, work on getting some of those preparations done ahead of time. What we now kind of see is that patients have kind of their tastes and preferences change before and after the surgery. Oh. And so what they liked before surgery may not taste good after. So we kind of say, yeah, get this prepared, but don't spend too much money on that because you may not like it and then you'll want to 
try something else. So we give them a lot of different vitamin uh, options, chewable, swallow, you know, um, as well as different protein supplements. And then obviously their clear liquid preparations and then they're soft. And yeah, we, we try and get, give them as much. Our dietitian spends a lot of time before and after surgery kind of giving them as much knowledge as you can. So you, you mentioned like vitamins and minerals. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you're getting absorption of all of those because sometimes after surgery. Yes, both surgeries, patients will have vitamin deficiencies based on the surgery. So it is important that they uh, understand that iron supplementation, calcium supplementation, and the B complexes are part of their new kind of reg regimen. So if I was trying to explain to my kids how successful this is going to be, what would I say? I think both operations are very successful. Again, the opportunity we have to work with them before surgery, if patients are listening, they're bringing their workbook, they're starting to do the things we suggest, we know that they're much more likely to be successful and compliant with the recommendations after surgery. Patients that are kind of don't have their support, really aren't ready to make those behavioral changes, probably shouldn't have the surgery because we don't want to give them a tool to be successful and then have them use the tool incorrectly. That will be no benefit to them. So I have to commit. Absolutely. I have to commit. Hmm. So you said minimal, minimally invasive. So you make a hole here or... There's five small incisions five small that are incisions. underneath the rib cage. And, That's amazing. Uh, yep. So you do it all through a telescope? Laparoscope, yep. Small, <laughs> yep. Small scope. Does, do they kind of feel bloated afterwards? For a day or two, yep. We do have to insufflate their abdomen with a CO2, which is what we exhale, so that we have room to do the operation. And then that gas slowly dissolves over 24 hours. So you feel pregnant? A little bloated, yes. <laughs> Okay, um, no problems going to the bathroom? No. no. All right. Um, back to work. What are the risks might be associated? That's a perfect question because we can't sugarcoat it. There are lots of benefits to the surgery, but there are also risks. And when we do our seminar and we give them their packets and we go through the risks up until the day before surgery, they have to understand that there are risks with the operation. The good news is, is the hard work that the centers of excellence and the national societies have done, and we're going through an inspection this week, is you look critically at your outcomes. And if your outcomes aren't along the national standards, then you need to fi figure that out and fix that issue, or you'll lose your accreditation. And so, but we can't make it zero. I mean, patients have to understand that there are complications from these surgeries a leak from the surgery line, uh, a pulmonary embolism if they're not active and we don't you know, get a good anticoagulation program for them. There are risks, and those risks are small, but not zero. Well, yeah, I, t I tell people any surgical procedure, even being put to sleep, is risky. Even having a tooth extracted yeah. can be risky. It's just that you understand them <clears throat> and you weigh them. But there's plenty of data that we show at our seminar is that there are risks to the surgery, but there are also risks to keeping the same health problems on and on and on. And if you take match controls of patients that are obese or morbidly obese that have surgery versus don't have surgery, there's about a 50% reduction in the risk of them having a fatal problem uh, demise from their health in just five to 10 years. So they'll see a dramatic improvement uh, in their overall in health their overall absolutely health. Uh, which is interesting um, you know it's hard you know if you're married and you have one person who's a little bit overweight and there's generally a family kind of social what mm -hmm. we eat before we go to bed or what we eat while we're watching television is my spouse going to have to change his eating habits to yeah. support the success yeah, I just did a husband and wife last week. They were separated by a week. They both had the same operation. A lot of times, husband and wife choose different operations. <laughs> and that sometimes can be because they're always this internal competition. 
Um, and we don't want one person to do well and the other person not. They have to support each other. So it is sometimes a little tricky, but we do see pay, uh, families that typically have eating issues and health problems from that typically do kind of run in families. And the whole family, when they come to see me, the whole family might need to consider something as well. Yeah, and including the dog. No scraps. <laughs> No scraps for the dog. What about smoking? Is that a contraindication? Absolutely, yes. We don't offer our surgeries to anyone that smokes, and smoking cessation is difficult, as like anything else. Um, so we have to, in that six-month preparation, if they are smoking, have to get them off of uh, nicotine. Um, and so that, that is quite a bit of a challenge for some, some folks, but they can do it. Yeah, and we can help them do it. Absolutely. Yeah, we're here to help them and help them to get ready and get better. So it is a new year. It is 2019, and with that come all these New Year's resolutions, and we're going to be healthier. And so now you've gotten all the information that you need on bariatric surgery. Help you lose weight, which has so many spin-off benefits. Get rid of your diabetes. Get rid of your hypertension. Have more ambulation. Feel better when you exercise. What if we have questions for you, Dr. Mancini? How can we get a hold of you? Lots of ways. I mean, my <laughs> office is always open, and I'm happy to, you know, get emails and that sort of questions, or go to our website, utsurgery.com, and there's lots of information about weight loss surgery. Love the university. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Liz. And that's a wrap. This episode of Doc Talk is brought to you by. The Kappa Boot Scootin' Ball featuring the president of the Redneck Yacht Club himself, Craig Morgan. Trackers, liners, and a party ball. Join us Friday, April 5th for the Knoxville's most talked about fundraiser of the year. The event will be packed with great country music provided by Craig Morgan, line dancing, western themed dinner, bottomless beverage, and an exclusive Kappa Boot Scootin' Ball souvenir mug. Additionally, a silent auction valued at more than $40,000 give the opportunity for those in attendance to bid on some packages, including a Dynasty Spa. For tickets, visit kappabootscootin.com. 